Hello there, AP Environmental Science class. Welcome back to part two of my lecture on chapter nine, Sustaining Biodiversity, Saving Species, and Ecosystem Services. We finished off in part one talking about how when we fragment habitats, um, it, causes, uh, it causes issues with the breeding, the migration of species, and that could uh, eventually lead to species ex extinction here on the planet. Next thing we'll talk about, uh, starting off here in part two, are invasive species. I know you've heard a lot about those um, lantern flies, for instance, right? Uh, we've been talking a lot about those uh, recently, right? Lantern flies are an example of an invasive species. Now, many species introdu introductions are beneficial, but when we talk about invasive species, most of the time uh, we're talking about these that uh, produce non-beneficial things for the uh, for the environment. So, not, what are invasive species? Uh, they are non-native species to whatever environment or biome they are put in. Uh, they may have no natural predators in that environment, competitors, parasites, or pathogens. Uh, Non-native species can often crowd out native species. And again, if they're viewed as harmful, uh, we call them invasive species. So here are just a few of the almost 7,100 um, estimated invasive species that have been introduced here to the United States. Uh, again, your purple loosestrife, uh, the killer bee, uh, the kudzo uh, vine, we'll talk about in just a second, uh, the European wild boar, uh, the, the Formosian termite, the zebra mussel, uh, the Burmese python, the fire ant uh, is an invasive species here in the U.S., uh, and the sea lamprey here, which is a parasite uh, attached to that lake trout. Just again, just some examples of, uh, of invasive species. You'll notice the top here, they were deliberately introduced on the bottom here, accidentally introduced. But I guess at the end of the day, it really doesn't matter if they're deliberately or accidentally introduced here. Uh, if they are non native, if they are invasive, uh, they obviously can uh, destroy environment. So the case study we talk about here is the kudzu vine. Uh, it was imported from Japan in the 1930s. It was imported to the United States to help control soil erosion. But what happens is that these vines spread so rapidly that they take over land. They're very difficult to kill. Uh, there is a common fungus that can kill the vine. But again, here in the United States, that fungus is not native either, right? So we need to investigate some of the harmful side effects of that fungus. But again, you in, in, in introduce the vine here, uh, that fungus isn't around to try and uh, curb uh, the vine spreading, right? There are some benefits, again, medicinal and nutritional uses. It could be used as paper or bio, biofuel. But again, what you're noticing, though, is this. This is a guy in Georgia whose car has been totally uh, taken in here uh, by the, 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 the kudzu vine here, right? Because they grow so rapidly, they grow so fast, and they basically grow uncontrolled because they have no native uh, predators or, or, again, pathogens or disease or fungus or things like that uh, to kill them here in the United States. So again, uh, just one of the examples, this uh, vine was deliberately put in to help with soil erosion, but again, obviously led to many other issues uh, than than they wanted, right? And so now we have this uh, invasive species. Another one uh, are accidentally introduced, like the Burmese python I showed you uh, about in the chart two slides ago. Burmese python, African python, boa constrictors. Uh, we find them in Florida a lot because they're actually pets that were imported, uh, but then people don't want their pets, so then release them into the uh, Everglades, the wetlands. Well, predation by these animals is altering the food webs and ecosystem services in the Everglades because, again, they have no natural predators, so they're just eating everything up. Nothing's eating them. Uh, and they're just basically, uh, you know, uh, multiplying unchecked. These were accidentally, again, people brought them in as pets. They didn't want them. They let them go. And then you see things like this showing up in the Florida Everglades, right? Again, uh, not native to Southern Florida. Um, this is a picture of a Burmese python, again, found in the Florida Everglades. Again, a non-native invasive species. So how can we control these invasive species? Well, research programs are needed to first identify all the invaders that we have. Then we need to track your invasive species with ground surveys and satellite observations. We need to establish international treaties that ban the transfer of these invasive species between countries. And obviously, we need more education about releasing exotic 
pets and plants into the environment. So again, a chart here. What can you do? Uh, again, I love these little charts in the book, in the in the lectures here, because they're great uh, bullets to understand uh, for potential FRQ answers down the road, right? What can you do to control? Do not buy wild plants and animals or remove them from natural areas. Do not release wild pets in natural areas. Do not dump aquarium contents or unused fishing bait into waterways or storm drains. When camping, only use local firewood and brush or clean pet dogs, hiking boots, mountain bikes, canoes, boats, fishing tackle, other gear before entering or leaving wild areas because you could be walking in the Adirondacks and get something on your boot, not clean it, and then maybe two months later you're hiking down in North Carolina on that boot. Well, that boot, whatever is stuck to it, maybe lived, and now you leave it in North Carolina. Now you brought something from the Adirondacks in New York down to North Carolina to the... Uh, to the uh, Appalachians down there, maybe that that organism that was on your boot wasn't native to uh, the Appalachians of North Carolina, and now you have an invasive species. So obviously, prevention is the best way to reduce threats from invasive species. All right. Uh, other issues, again, we're talking in this chapter about sustaining biodiversity. So we spoke about invasive species and how we can uh, sustain our biodiversity by not having those invasive species around. Uh, now we're going to talk about population growth, high rate of resource use, pollution, and climate change as, again, all reasons that we're losing biodiversity here on this planet and ways that we can kind of mitigate some of these issues. So uh, we spoke about this in the last chapter, obviously, human population growth and rising resources resource use per person is degrading wildlife habitat, right? We got so many people on this planet. Uh, we're needing all these resources. Uh, and again, that is degrading our, our, our natural capital. Pollution are, is degrading that as well. We have two words, bioaccumulation and biomagnification that you need to know about. Bioaccumulation occurs in individual organisms as the, the they accumulate this, this, this uh, pollution in their bodies. Biomagnification occurs when a chemical becomes more concentrated as it moves up through food chains and webs. And I'm going to show you a picture on that in just a second. Climate change will also accelerate the sixth mass extinction that we believe we are in currently, a major loss of diversity and ecosystem services with the rapid change in climate. Again, uh, we've had plenty of climate change on this planet in the past, but it's happened so slowly that creatures and plants have been able to adapt through natural selection and evolution to that climate change. Unfortunately, the sixth one, or this what's happening right now, uh, it's happening so rapidly that creatures, organisms, plants, animals are not able to adapt. Uh, and that's why we're seeing uh, all these extinctions and a major loss of biodiversity. So this talks a little bit about that biomagnification of, of, of pollution. This talks about DDT, which was a chemical that was used uh, many years ago. This is actually a, a New York State food chain and what you'll notice is when the DDT is in the water, it's, it's very low concentration, right? Three parts per trillion, okay? But what, so had this chemical, it gets dissolved in the ocean, very small, uh, or, or water lakes, let's say in this case in New York State, um, but very small part, only three parts per trillion. But what happens through biomagnification is you, as you go up through the trophic levels, you actually magnify that chemical, so, for instance, when we get to the zooplankton, it's at 0 0.04 parts per million, okay? So, you'll notice much greater, this is three parts per trillion here, right? Now, we're at that DDT in the zooplankton is 0 0.04 parts per million. Well, the fish are eating the zooplankton, right? So, as we go up through the trophic levels through the food chain, the chemical is magnified. So, by the time the fish eat the eat the zooplankton in the fish's bodies the ddt is now 0.5 parts per million right from 0 0.04 to 0.5 parts per million then you have this this osprey these birds that eat the fish well when the birds eat the fish that ddt gets further magnified in their bodies because again we're going up through the trophic levels up through the food chain and in the fish it's actually uh oh, excuse me the larger needle fish two parts per million and then in the osprey 25 parts per million, right? So this is biomagnification. This is why, for instance, people say don't eat so much salmon, right? Because salmon that is grown commercially, and we'll talk about uh, mass production of, of, of fish coming up in a couple of chapters, but salmon that is grown commercially gets a lot of mercury in it. What happens is salmon are up at the top or uh, kind of higher up in the food chain, right? In, in aquatic systems. So as the salmon eat 
the, 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 the smaller fish that the salmon have, they're getting more mercury because that mercury is being biomagnified. Then you and I eat the salmon. We're even higher up on the trophic level than the salmon. And so that mercury is even higher in our bodies because of that biomagnification. And that's why they say you don't want to eat salmon every day uh, because you could get higher levels of mercury. Again, it's all about this biomagnification. As you go through the food chain, as you go up through trophic levels, any pollution is magnified uh, over and over again as you continue up. So by the time you get to the top of the food chain, um, that pollution is a lot of it. And that creature is eating a lot of that pollution. And that's why we're having some issues, again, with uh, extinction of certain creatures. So um, other problems that we have out there is illegally killing, capturing, and selling wild species. So believe it or not, poaching and smuggling of protected animals is a huge moneymaker out there. It is illegal, uh, but organized crime has become involved because of the used profits. Elephants and rhinos are being killed for their tusks and their horns, nothing else. Tigers are being poached for their skin and other body parts. And we also have the pet trade, exotic birds, amphibians, reptiles, drop Tropical fish, for instance, those Burmese pythons, right? If someone wants them as a pet, then realize uh, this is too much for me. And then uh, let's go with that creature in, in somewhere out in, the, in nature where it shouldn't be. It becomes an invasive species or maybe just dies itself, right? You leave, you let a Burmese python go in Florida, it'll live. You let a Burmese python go in Canada, it may not live, right? Because it's too cold. So again, uh, this is how we see our biodiversity being reduced here on planet Earth. Tough picture to see, guys, but you got to see it, all right? This is a, a white rhino, which is a, an endangered uh, animal, uh, endangered species. And basically poachers just killed it for its two horns. That's it. Rest of the creature was left, right? I mean, in the olden days, people would hunt animals, but they would use every single part of this animal, right? For food, for clothing, for for maybe uh, using the rhino's skin for, for, for a house, right? Or, or some kind of uh, structure. Uh, not with these poachers. They just took the horns and they left the dead rhino there. Again, this is how we, another way, we are destroying our biodiversity. And we're losing bird species on this planet. 70% uh, actually of, bird, of the world's bird species are declining. One of every eight bird species are threatened with extinction, mostly in our tropical forests because we're fragmenting them and cutting them down to produce uh, land for people to live or for farmland. Again, habitat loss, degradation, migrating birds, invasive species, climate change, all leading uh, to uh, this 70% of the world's uh, bird species declining. Pesticides as well, over-exploitation. Again, parrots threatened because they are captured and sold as pets. You can sell a parrot for about $1,500, $2,000. Uh, I've had friends who actually have, have kept parrots as pets, and they are very expensive, right? So you can make money. Uh, birds are an indicator species, like the amphibians we spoke about a couple of chapters ago. They respond very quickly to environmental change. So when we see the bird species declining, uh, we know the environment is, is changing and not changing for the better. Birds perform critical ecosystem and economic services. So again, extinctions could affect many other species out there. In addition, rising demand for bushmeat threatens some African species. Yes, believe it or not, bushmeat is a huge source of food in West and Central Africa. Uh, hunting this wildlife has skyrocketed within the past couple of decades. One species of red colobus monkey has actually been uh, hunted to extinction because its meat was so good. And we're seeing reduced populations of orangutans, gorillas, chimpanzees, elephants, and hippos because people are using or killing these animals and then eating them okay so in a way that's good but in a way that's bad because they're we're basically over killing we're over exploiting these 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 bush creatures and as a result many of them are becoming either threatened or or critically endangered uh usaid is introducing methods for breeding alternative sources of protein to villagers um so again this usaid program instead of saying hey, uh, go out and, and kill a gorilla or a chimpanzee. Here's another way you can breed or cre create protein uh, for your villagers to have. Uh, again, so another tough, tough uh, picture to see. Obviously, this is the head of the endangered lowland gorilla, um, but it, his head was chopped off because its body was used as bush meat. Um, so again, another, uh, that rising demand also threatens some of our, of our African species and threatening our biodiversity on this planet. 
So final part of this chapter, right, is how can we sustain all these wild species? What can we do to help curb um, the loss of biodiversity and species on this planet and the ecosystem services that they provide? Well, ways to reduce species extinction and sustain ecosystem services. Number one, establishing and enforcing national environmental laws and international treaties, along with creating protective wildlife sanctuaries. So we're going to go through a couple of these treaties and laws. My advice is to write them down. You are going to have to memorize some of these for not only multiple choice test questions, uh, but also for potential FRQs, not only for uh, my test on this uh, chapter, but of course, uh, the big test uh, coming up in the spring. So in 1975, uh, City was uh, was enacted. This is the, was the Convention on International Trade in Endangered Species of Wild Fauna and Flora. Again, CITES is the uh, acronym. It was signed by 181 countries. And again, this kind of regulated the trade internationally of endangered uh, species of either uh, plants or animals. We also have the Convention on Biological Diversity, the BCD. Uh, this commits governments to reduce the rate of biodiversity loss. It was ratified by 190 96 countries, of course, not by us, though. Um, and uh, this law, though, lacks uh, enforcement mechanisms. Unfortunately, a lot of these laws and treaties uh, lack the enforcement mechanisms because obviously that causes money and that also um, leads to morality issues around the uh, are, are, are around the planet um, but again just you need to know these treaties and laws and kind of uh, uh, kind of what they what they mean and when they were enacted uh, ESA the endangered species act of 1973 it has been amended several times uh, this is used to identify and protect endangered species in the US and abroad it creates recovery programs for listed species uh, the National Marine Fishery Service uh, kind of does this for ocean species uh, the US fish and wildlife service uh, handles uh, the Endangered Species Act for all other species, so basically uh, terrestrial species. Uh, and again, this is the one, this is the act where we label a, a, a creature either critically endangered or, uh, or, or endangered or things like that, kind of listed in categories, and then uh, special programs are created uh, to, try to, uh, to try to salvage and to create to create more of these creatures to then put them out into the wild and hopefully uh, increase the population of those creatures. So again, uh, the ESA uh, forbids federal agencies from funding projects that jeopardize endangered or threatened species. Again, threatened uh, it would be it would be another one of those categories we talked about. It requires commercial shipments of wildlife come through certain ports so that they can be checked. Um, and in 2015, uh, almost 1,600 species uh, have officially been listed on on the either uh, endangered or threatened species list. Um from the ESA. So uh, a very important law there. 90% of ESA protected species are recovering at the projected rate. So again, this is a uh, positive for us here. Um, again, this, this, this act, this ESA act has uh, really the U.S. Uh, Endangered Species Act really has helped uh, in the curbing of uh, the extinction rates of many of these creatures, especially here in the United States, where we can uh, enforce, uh, enforce this law uh, a, a little bit better. Um, so how are these environmental policies, these treaties, these laws uh, actually created? Well, it begins when citizens like you and I, interest groups or corporations seek solutions to issues. Um, basically, it is a policy life cycle. You identify a problem, you research the science, you craft a policy solution, you monitor how well it works, and then you adjust the policy as needed. Many of you may get into this. This is lobbying groups, things like that. So if you do get into um, some sort of environmental career down the road, um, um, this is some of the stuff uh, that you may be getting into uh, to help uh, basically frame and write maybe potential environmental policy here uh, in the United States for future generations. All right, so what else can we do to protect our biodiversity and to protect our species? Well, establishing wildlife refuge and other protected areas is yet another way we can do this. So in 1903, Theodore Roosevelt established the first federal wildlife refuge on Pelican Island in Florida. What is a wildlife refuge? Well, most are wetland sanctuaries. They provide habitats for about 25% of U.S. threatened or endangered species. However, harmful activities such as 
mining, drilling, and using off-road vehicles are actually legal in most refuges. And obviously, uh, that uh, maybe not the best thing as they uh, will continue to harm uh, those refuges. Uh, and here we have, this is Pelican Island National Refuge in Florida. Again, this was America's first. So again, what does it mean? These pelicans live there. We can't go there and hunt them or kill them or change their habitat. And so uh, this allows them to breed and to multiply and to uh, hopefully uh, continue uh, to increase the population of these pelicans or anything else that happens uh, to be a living or calling that wildlife refuge its home. Other things we can do, seed banks, botanical gardens, and wildlife farms. What is a seed bank? A seed bank preserves genetic material of endangered plants. They actually have one. Uh, I believe it's in either Alaska or Canada, but they, it's like underneath the ground, and they're actually putting um, these seeds of all these plants in there so that down the road, if a plant happens to go extinct, well, you have its seed, and then you can uh, regrow it. Botanical gardens and, and uh, arboretas. Uh, these are uh, where you can have living plants or trees, all right, uh, living there, and we can control them and, and keep them healthy and, and make sure that we have them um, here on the planet. And we can also uh, have farms that can raise organisms for commercial sale. We call them wildlife farms, but then that can eat. Uh, if we're selling them for commercial sale, uh, we're not hunting them in the wild for commercial sale, right? We're kind of raising them um, on the these farms. Zoos and aquariums also play a role in protecting and saving ecosystem services and species. Uh, techniques for preserving endangered terrestrial species, egg pulling, captive breeding, artificial insemination, embryo transfer, use of incubators and cross fostering are all ways that humans have taken endangered species out in the wild, bring them into zoos and aquariums and try to breed them. And then with the ultimate goal of releasing them back out into the wild. Right, the ultimate goal of any captive breeding program is releasing or reintroducing those populations back to the wild. Um, captive populations must number one to five hundred individuals for this to work. Uh, and public aquariums provide education, uh, but not effective gene banks due to limited funds uh, in public aquariums. So we're not doing this as much in aquariums as we are in zoos. But some aquariums are. For instance, this is the Monterey. Uh, Bay Aquarium in uh, California. You'll notice here a tidewater uh, here in the uh, in the uh, aquarium, and what that tidewater is used for is to help train rescued sea otter pups, right? So they'll rescue these sea otter pups that were maybe born, maybe the mother or the father were, was killed or eaten or something like that. So they'll rescue these pups, they'll bring them to the aquarium, they'll train them here, and the ultimate goal is to release the pups back into the wild to then increase uh, that sea otter population. Again, that is is uh, the ultimate goal. All right, uh, kind of finishing up this chapter with just a couple of slides. The first slide talks about something called the precautionary principle, which is very important in environmental science. Uh, this is acts to prevent or reduce harm when preliminary evidence indicates acting is needed, right? So basically, it's precautionary. Even if you see something, preliminary evidence, even if you're not 100% sure, the precautionary principle says act now, don't wait. Good strategy in other areas of well, preventing exposure to harmful chemicals in our air, water, and food. Uh, the emphasis is on preventing species extinction. Act early rather than when species are nearly extinct. This is what we're talking about with birds, right? We're seeing 70% of the birds, uh, the population is declining. Doesn't mean 70% of birds are becoming extinct. It just means their populations are declining. But to me, that shows that we have some preliminary evidence that shows that birds could be the next uh, species that goes uh, extinct or becomes very endangered, right? These different species of birds. So the point is, act now. We see some preliminary evidence. Act now before you only have a couple of birds left of, of one particular species. That's really uh, what the precautionary principle talks about. All right. Uh, protecting species and ecosystem services, of course, raises difficult questions. We've talked about that a lot in this class, right? How do you tell one country that you, you can do this when another country or culture, uh, you can't do this, et cetera, et cetera. So should we focus on protecting species or ecosystems and the services they provide, right? Do you want to, do we care more about the species or do we care more about the economic and the economic service that the species provides? We have to decide that. Which species gets attention, right? Protecting species appealing to humans can increase public awareness of the needs, but how do we determine that, right? Why do we protect a beautiful parrot and not an ugly insect, right? Is that fair? Again, 
How do we determine which habitat areas need to be protected? How do we allocate the resources, right? Again, these are all um, morality issues that come with environmental science. Um, and these are coming some of the issues that of course, we need to uh, figure out uh, over the course of the next 50 to 100 years. So protecting species, ecosystem services, what can you do? All right, this will be the final uh, final chart here of the lecture. Do not buy furs, ivory products, or other items made from endangered or threatened animal species. Do not buy wood or wood products from tropical or old growth forests, right? We want to try to not cut them down. Do not buy pet animals or plants taken from the wild and tell friends and relatives what you're doing. Again, education is always the key. That concludes my lecture on chapter nine, sustaining biodiversity, saving species and ecosystem services. And as always, I thank you for listening.